Do you have an actual one? No, I don't. Yeah, sure. Sure. The Stephanus number? Stephanus numbers. numbers. I was wondering, I had a text with thousand numbers. Mm -hmm. I got to get another one. That's right. Sixty-nine. Ah, divides it up differently. Should be right here. No, okay. This is where we're going, though. Okay. Very helpful. How's your, got a drink? Ah. Uh -huh.
What is that? Is it the warmer? <laughs> What is it that we, without which? What's the hormone? Oh. Oh, you can't have one without the other. one without the other.
Do you need it? No, go ahead. I can come back. Interesting. So what do you say? Need more time? There are different kinds of soul. There are two kinds of causes.
How about a reader and we play? Okay? I'll read. Step 10 from being the necessary nature from there? Sure. Such then, being the necessary nature of all these things, the artificer, the most fair, and Hold it best. Down. Oh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm loud. <laughs> I don't mind. Such then, being the necessary nature of all these things, the artificer of the most beautiful and the best, took them over at that time amongst things generated, when he was engendering the self-sufficing and most perfect God. And their inherent properties he used as subservient causes, but himself designed the good in all that was being generated. Wherefore, one ought to distinguish two kinds of causes, the necessary and the divine, and in all these things to seek after the divine for the sake of gaining a life of blessedness so far as our nature admits thereof, and to seek the necessary for the sake of the divine, reckoning that without the former it is impossible to discern by themselves about the divine objects, about the divine objects after which we strive, or to apprehend them, or in any way partake thereof. Okay. Hey, this is called the second creation. Right? He's taking everything that he did before, pulling it together, and look what he's saying about it. He was engendering the self-sufficient, most perfect God. Hmm. So all creation he's calling a God, self-sufficient. So, so it's called a God, called divine. Hey, would you agree he's doing the second thing? He's taking the inherent properties as subservient causes. But he himself is designing the good in all that is being generated. Hey. Therefore, he's putting in a good in all that's being generated. Mm -hmm. Hey, everything that follows from this line all the way to 72 is a package. So let's look. Look at it. See? In order to do this, you need to do two things. You have to understand there are two kinds of causes in nature and all that exists the necessary and the divine. Hey, the necessary are going to be the way the body functions and all the ways in which it functions, but it's all must be fit together to the divine. So therefore, whatever you're doing, seek the necessary for the sake of the divine. That's the connection. Hmm. Now he has to show that in the physical body. So, because there are different kinds of souls. Now, he's got a nice intro. Uh, Notice the way he concludes in the second paragraph. Seeing then that we have now lying before us and thoroughly sifted like wood ready for the joiner, the various kinds of causes out of which 
the rest of our account must be woven together. Let's go back to our starting point. Proceed rapidly to the point where we are now. In this way, we're going to endeavor to supplement our story. Everything that came before it, he's now going to add to it. Hmm. This is why it's called the second phase of creation. Watch it, last sentence. In this way, we shall endeavor now to supplement our story with a conclusion and a crown in harmony with that which has gone before it. So he has two parts, right? From 27 to 69, part one. Yeah, but look what he's telling us. This is the important part. So this is, this is, this is why it's called the second creation, because that's where you're seeing how the good is going to be infiltrated into all that is. That's what he's doing. He's putting the good in everything that is created. We have to see that. See, that's our task. We've got to say, what is he talking about? Right? Because here's man. Uh-uh. He's saying, look here. You have to see man, not like this, but if every part is harmonized together, <coughs> that's where we're going. Very much like the dream we just read. <coughs> right? As we stated in the commencement, all these things were done in a state of disorder. Right? What did God do? He implanted all kinds of proportions. Right? And they were in relation to themselves and their relations with one another. And they're all going to be put together in harmony and in analogy. Look here, therefore your job is to see, given this rough image of man, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the ideal that can be made or can be attributed to man. If you do what? Do you understand how God put all of the parts in a certain order and proportion? We have to do that. And that's what he's going to do. So God implanted in these and them proportions and, and they're in relation to themselves and to one another. What is he talking about? We don't know yet, right? But he's going to say in man there are different kinds of souls. These have to come together in harmony through analogy. They have to all be brought together in a higher relationship with one another. Hmm. Um, you got the line now, it's C. But he, in the first place, set all these things in order. Then out of these, he constructed this present universe. Hey. This is all there is. This is the cosmos. It's all that is. Including man. 
What is it? You say the whole cosmos together, taken together, is a single living creature. Within itself, all living creatures, both mortal and immortal. And he's the dude, right? God's the dude who constructed all of this. He constructed, therefore, all things divine, but the structure of mortal natures, here we are, He called on other kinds of gods. Hey, come on, guys. We're going to pull this off. Right? They're called various names. Junior gods. Uh, what he calls here uh, sons of gods. are going to help to bring this about. Why? In Greek philosophy, the demiurgos cannot do anything that is not eternal. This is dealing with mortal creatures living and dying. Therefore, he needs another kind of assistance called sons of God to finish it. And that's what we're now doing. And what are they going to do? They're going to imitate him. Receiving the immortal principle of the soul framed around a body. So in the soul, Ah. Now there are going to be different kinds of souls. And there's going to be a relationship between them. And when they're perfectly concordant with one another, there's a harmony and analogy between these. And in order for that to be done, he needs the sons of God to help him in this final phase of creation. And they imitating him, got it? At point D. Barbara? Sure. And they imitating him on receiving the immortal principle of soul framed around it a mortal body, and gave it all the body to be its vehicle, and housed therein besides another form of soul, even the mortal form, which has within it passions, both fearful and unavoidable. Firstly, pleasure, a most mighty lure to evil. Next, pain, or pains, which put good to rout, and besides these rashness and fear, foolish counselors both, and anger, hard to dissuade, and hope, ready to seduce. And blending these with irrational sensation and with all daring lust, they thus compounded in necessary fashion the mortal kind of soul. Wherefore, since they scrupled to pollute the divine, unless through absolute necessity, they planted the mortal kind apart therefrom in another chamber of the body, building an isthmus and boundary for the head and chest by setting between them the neck, to the end that they might remain apart. And within the chest, or thorax as it is called, they fastened the mortal kind of soul. And inasmuch as one part thereof is better, and one worse, they built a division within the cavity of the thorax as if to fence off 
two separate chambers for men and for women by placing the midriff between them as a screen. That part of the soul, then, which partakes of courage and spirit, since it is a lover of victory, they planted more near to the head, between the midriff and the neck, in order that it might hearken to the reason, and in conjunction therewith, might forcibly subdue the tribe of the desires, whensoever they should utterly refuse to yield willing obedience to the word of command from the citadel of reason. And the heart, which is the junction of the veins and the fount of the blood, which circulates vigorously through all the limbs, they appointed to be the chamber of the bodyguard, to the end that when the heat of the passion boils up, as soon as reason passes the word round that some unjust action is being done, which affects them, either from without or possibly even from the interior desires, every organ of sense in the body might quickly perceive through all the channels, both the injunctions and the threats, and in all ways obey and follow them, thus allowing the best part to be the leader of them all. And as a means of relief for the leaping of the heart in times when dangers are expected and passion is excited, since they knew that all such swelling of the passionate parts would arise from the action of fire, they contrived and implanted the form of the lungs. That is, this is, in the first place, soft and bloodless. And moreover, it contains within it perforated cavities like those of a sponge, so that when it receives the breath and the drink, it might have a cooling effect and furnish relief and comfort in the burning heat. To this end, they drew the channels of the windpipe to the lungs and placed the lungs as a kind of padding around the heart, in order that when the passion therein should be at its height by leaping upon a yielding substance, by leaping upon a yielding substance and becoming cool, the heart might suffer less and thereby be enabled the more to be subservient to the reason in these times of passion. And all that part of the soul which is subject to appetites for food, foods and drinks, and all the other wants that are due to the nature of the body, they planted in the parts midway between the midriff and the boundary at the navel, fashioning as it were a manger in all this region for the feeding of the body. And there they tied up this part of the soul as though it were a creature, that which though savage, they must necessarily keep joined to the rest and feed if the mortal stock were to exist at all. In order then that this part, feeding thus at its manger and housed as far away as possible from the counseling part and creating the least possible turmoil and din, should allow the supreme part to take counsel as in peace concerning what benefits all, both individually and in the mass. For these reasons, they stationed it in that position. And inasmuch as they knew that it could not understand reason, and that even if it did have some share in the perception of reasons, it would have no natural instinct to pay heed to any of them, but would be bewitched for the most part both day and night by images and phantasms. To guard against this, God devised and constructed the form of the liver and placed it in that part's abode and he fashioned it dense and smooth and bright and sweet, yet containing bitterness, that the power of thoughts which proceed from the mind, moving in the liver as in, in a mirror which receives impressions and provides visible images, should frighten this part of the soul. For when the mental power bears down upon it with stern threats, it uses a kindred portion of the liver's bitterness and makes it swiftly suffuse the whole liver so that it exhibits bilious colors and by contraction makes it all wrinkled and rough. Moreover, as regards the lobe and passages and gates of the liver, the first of these it bends back from the straight and compresses while it blocks the others and closes them up and thus it produces pains and nausea. 
Okay, let's hold it. Look her. Within the body, therefore, there are four centers. Now the fifth comes in. The supreme part. All right. But there's a problem with the supreme part. It takes counsel and peace concerning what benefits everything, both individually and collectively. But it's polluted as a result of images and fantasy. Pretty amazing, huh? Right. There's a supreme, but it's polluted by images and fantasies. What are you going to do? Call Ghostbusters. He says, hey, you know what? This is the liver. That's the function of the liver. For him, the liver purifies. Hmm. It's the organ of purification. It wipes clean these images and fantasies from our soul. That takes place in the liver. Curious, isn't it? Okay. Uh, please look at B, 71B. To guard against these images and fantasies, God devised and constructed the form of the liver and placed it in the parts abode. And he fashioned it dense and smooth and bright and sweet, yet containing bitterness. That the power of thoughts, here we are, which proceed from the mind, moving in the liver as a mirror, which receives impressions and provides visible images, should frighten this part of the soul. For when the mental power bears down upon it with stern threats, it uses a, a, a kindred portion of the liver's bitterness and makes it swiftly, suffuses the whole liver. You know what it does? Now he has a long description of it. But it blocks, it blocks and closes up these negative forces. Therefore, okay, going further, I'm at C5. On the other hand, when the breath of mildness comes from intelligence, from the intellect, and paints on the liver. See, now noose comes in, mind, noose, intellect. It paints on the liver correct images, see? On the other hand, when a breath of, of, of mildness from the intellect paints on the liver appearances of the opposite kind, calms down its bitterness by refusing to move or touch the nature opposite to itself. Using the liver then, uh, the sweetness inherent within it rectifies the parts, straightens them up, smooths it, frees it. Right. What does it do? So it, it uh, so that at night it passes at times sensibly occupied in its slumber with divination. Hey, all of this is to take place at night. See, that's what then that's what happens when you're sleeping. For what purpose? 
So then it can be occupied in its slumber mm -hmm. with divination. Wow. And that and reason and intelligence, ah, has no share. Phronesis. Now, we want to read this next section with care. Barbara, for they were, okay? Okay. For they who constructed us, remembering the injunction of their father, when he enjoined upon them to make the mortal kind as good as they possibly could, rectified the vile part of us by thus establishing therein the organ of divination. What? <coughs> Go ahead. Pretty wild. That it might in some degree lay hold on truth. And that God gave unto man's foolishness the gift of divination, a sufficient token is this. No man achieves true and inspired divination when in his rational mind, but only when the power of his intelligence is fettered in sleep or when it is distraught by disease or by reason of some divine inspiration. Okay, here comes the big sentence. All right, go ahead. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the divining and inspired nature and all the visionary forms that were seen and by means of reasoning to discern. So I read that wrong. Okay. Okay. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in his dr in dream or waking vision by the divining and inspired nature and all the visionary forms that were seen and by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant and for whom they portend good or evil in the future, the past, or the present. <coughs> But it is not the task of him who has been in a state of frenzy and still continues therein to judge the apparitions and voices seen or uttered by himself. For it was well said of old that to do and to know one's own and oneself belongs only to him who is sound of mind. Here we come. Go ahead. Where, wherefore? Yes. Wherefore also it is customary to set the tribe of prophets to pass judgment upon those inspired divination. What do we need? A prophet. A tribe of them. Yes. Right? Yep. They're going to then They're going be the agent to make sure that the kind of dreams you have are legitimate and pass judgment in order to see whether they are true or false. Yeah. That's how he rect rectifies ah, the condition the, of man. Huh. Right? Quickly in summary form. Beautiful. I thought you'd enjoy that. Yeah. Keep going. Right? Keep going. Pardon me? Keep going. No, no, no. That's all. <laughs> Keep reading. No, 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 because it's only important. Yeah. No. This, this starts the better philosophical part of the time in. Mm. So we stop here mm. for the next time. For next okay? time, okay. okay. Now I know you're going to sneak off and read it yourself. Oh, well, it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> it says here, to pass a pound of these inspired divinations. So what do we, now look here. That's why we have to collect some money and put an ad in the penny saver. Tribe of prophets. Right. Wanted. We want to get in touch with. Yes. A tribe, a tribe yeah. of prophets, not one or two. A blooming tribe of them. And they can pass judgments on the dreams we have. Okay. I like this line about. Um, it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the or waking visions right by divining 
by the divining and inspired nature and all the visionary forms that were seen and by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant and for whom they portend evil or good in the future, the past or the present. I thought that's pretty that's cool. Like Lovely. In yeah. depth. Okay, look here. Uh, very few people go to the end of it, okay? So from 89 to the end, be careful to read it with care, okay? Now he's going to go on a higher level and have more fun. Okay? Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yes, fun. Do you want me to print those searches for Alkanus? Sorry. Do you want me to print the searches for Alkanus for you? No. no. I didn't know if you had a printer no. happening. I'll do that. No problem. Up. Ah. Where's stuff? Get, the, get another copy. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Are you an Paper artist pack. as well? Yeah. Because Bradley is. Yeah. I wondered if that was your 